Okay. Well, we'll just pick another one on there just for the heck of it. Um, so if we looked at bromine versus carbon, we want to do the same idea. Take advantage of the periodic table because you've got it. So where are those two elements? This one gets a little bit more tricky to deal with. So bromine is lower but further to the right. So that's where it gets a bit dicey. Um, typically when we go through and evaluate these, what do we say or how would we refer to bromine? What type of atom is it? Or is it classified on the periodic table? Halogen. Okay, so when we look at our halogens, typically what charge do you see our halogens typically? Negative charge. Okay, so one of the, the patterns that we can pick up out of the periodic table, and I'm going to attempt to draw this, but it's going to be awful. Um, there's our transition metals, there are P block and helium. Okay, if we look at our halogens, these are our nobles. I don't really care for that to be legible because we aren't going to use those. If we look at the halogens, they're almost always going to be negatively charged. There's very few exceptions where they're not going to hold a negative charge, okay? Which means if you see a halogen bound to anything, the charge or the partial charge that you would expect on that halogen should be negative, okay? Um, and that's where things get a little bit weird because typically we'd go based on our charges from electronegativity. Well, the electronegativity, I think even between bromine and carbon, bromine still is more electronegative. So you could have your electronegativities memorized. I don't expect you to do that. I really expect the trends, and then you try and pick up from there. So our halogens will almost always carry that negative charge. Then when we shift further to the left, what's the next group of elements that we're going to work with? Or what element in that next column are we going to be concerned about? Primarily just oxygen. We will see sulfur show up. We see that show up in a few different places, um, but it's not super important as far as organic chemistry goes. We move further to the left. What do we get? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Again, we see phosphorus show up, but again, not fairly or not very often. And even further over, you get carbon. Silicon's really rare, but that does show up much less frequently than. Uh, either phosphorus and sulfur. And then we get boron and aluminum both with kind of equal probabilities. And then we can shift all the way to the other side of the periodic table and we see all those metals. Well, the metals are always going to carry a positive charge, okay, if they're in an ionic state, okay? How would you know they're not in an ionic state? For instance, let's compare Magnesium carbon versus magnesium. What's the difference between those two magnesiums? Okay, a bond. Based on the electronegativity, where do those electrons spend most of their time? On the carbon, so that magnesium in that bond is positively charged, in fact, plus two. Okay, what about magnesium in the other one? in its elemental state. How do we know that it hasn't given up electrons? Number one, there's no bond. Number two, we don't see a charge. Upper right hand corner, we would expect to see that charge. Without that charge there, we assume it's zero. For it to be zero oxidation state, it has two electrons, okay? Which is gonna explain some of the chemistry behind magnesium or organometallic compounds a little bit later in the semester. In fact, probably Monday. Um, so be kind of familiar with the trends within the periodic table. Uh, we may consider some halogens to have relatively low electronegativity in comparison to some of the other elements. But you should almost always look and evaluate them as acting as negatively charged or partially negative. Okay. Evaluating as simple as this question may seem on the surface, every single problem you go through and do is evaluating a single bond. You're trying to determine which atom is the most positive, which atom is the most negative. Once you know the most negative atom, what should you do? React it with the most positive. To determine whether one's a negative or positive, you have to go back and look at those electronegativities. Okay? So it may seem like a, a simple 151 question, and a lot of people tend to not ask it, but 
if you boil everything down to those single bonds, you can actually pick up a lot of the chemistry. Okay. Um, hybridizations in question four. When you go through and look at those, I think I've got a reasonable table I can put into or post for you guys on this. What we want to do is look at the electron groups around an individual atom. So you need to be super familiar with the bonding patterns for very particular groups. So for instance, your halogens, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. Okay, so really, I would almost classify that as four atoms because I don't really see a difference between any of the halogens. You need to be familiar with their bonding characteristics. So in their neutral state, how many bonds should a halogen carry? One. One. Okay. How many should oxygen? Nitrogen. Carbon. Four. We could then go through and look at negative charge and positive charge. And we'd want to go through and be familiar with each of those bond uh, classifications and states. The next part is then to take that step further and look at their hybridizations. The hybridizations will become important because when we're looking at how two atoms interact with each other, we're looking at how the electrons change their positions. Well, where do the electrons exist? They exist in the valence what? Shells, what determines a shell? I mean, a fancy scientific name. Begins with O. Orbitals. So what we want to be aware of is what orbitals are our electrons in. If they're in a higher energy orbital, those electrons are likely to react. Okay? So we can start to predict something about the chemistry of each of these individual groups. So when we go through and try and determine hybridization for most things, almost all of these are going to have... Uh, eight electrons. So each in their ground state, we would expect that octet. But when we go to hybridization, it's not just do they have eight electrons around them, because in their neutral states they will. It's going to be where are those electrons located. Okay? If each of those groups of electrons is located in a unique environment, that's slightly different than if we have groups of electrons in the same place, and we get different hybridizations. Okay? So I don't know why I drew this thing, because I didn't like that chart. It's not what I wanted Okay. So if we look at, say, a nitrogen atom, one of the common ways we would draw it out is say something like this. If we draw out ammonia, everyone agree with this? Is that a good way to draw NH3? Not in this class. What's wrong with that structure? Show the lone pairs. Um, why are the lone pairs typically not drawn on there? Really simple, stupid reason. We're lazy. Even though nitrogen usually has three bonds, so they just. So we like assume that. that things are there. When you're trying to learn the material, if we start assuming, then it's a question of did you assume correctly or incorrectly. So don't assume, always show the lone pairs. Set everything up so you can see it. I will try my best to always include the lone pairs when they're uh, in each of the structures. Okay? It makes a big difference. So now when we go through and take a look at this, we want to evaluate where are the groups of electrons. Well, what does that line represent? Sorry. Drawing over a line in the same color is a bad idea. What does that line represent? Two electrons. Two electrons, okay, in a bond. So we typically, or at least I like to refer to lines as being bonds. Okay, if you go to older chemists, they don't like that, but tough. It makes more sense this way. So every time we see a line, we know we have a group of electrons. So we could go around this nitrogen atom now and say, well, how many groups of electrons are there? Four groups, David. We've got four groups of electrons. Okay. To generate four distinct groups, we have to hybridize certain orbitals to generate that. We'd be looking at the valence shell for nitrogen. Why the valence shell? Why not the interior shell? Yes. You want to try and push that a little bit further? It's not so much just where the electrons are located. We're looking at how two atoms interact with each other. Okay? 
if we were going to, if I was going to walk up to any one of you, let's say I'm going to pick on you, sorry. And I'm going to walk up and start to point at him. Okay? And I'm going to keep walking at him until I run into him. What's going to hit him first? My hand. Okay. Does he care about my other hand? probably doesn't care about it. Why not? Because it's not what's going to directly impact it. So when we're looking at electron uh, configurations, we're concerned about the outer shells. And we go through the electron configurations for something like nitrogen, carbon, or oxygen, or even most of our halogens, we're looking at the S and P orbitals. We don't have a way to generate four unique orbitals, or four, yeah, four unique orbitals that give us those correct bond angles. This is where hybridization theory comes in. So this is why we take the S and all three P, and we would generate four sp3 hybrid orbitals. So we would look for the electron groups around it. One thing that you can do, this is S to what power? How many S orbitals are being used? Just one. How many P orbitals are being used? Three. If we add one plus three, we get... One plus three. Four groups of electrons. Now I know the hybridization. What happens if I go through and change this structure now? And instead of being that, I go through to this. We're going to ignore carbon. I'm concerned about nitrogen right now. Okay. How many groups of electrons are now around that nitrogen? Three groups of electrons. So how can I add one s orbital and three p orbitals to get three. sp2. One s, two p's. Okay? And we would end up with now, instead of four orbitals, we have three. Okay? What's an important conclusion from that? How many p orbitals are there? Total. Every single atom. How many p orbitals were there when we looked at a single nitrogen atom without a double bond? Three. Three p orbitals. Okay. How many p orbitals have we used to hybridize? Two, which means what happened to that leftover p orbital? <laughs> Blows up. Okay, we can't create or destroy matter just like we can't create or destroy orbitals. That orbital is still present. What is that orbital being involved in? The pi bond. Why do we call it a pi bond? What orbital is involved in a pi bond? P. What does pi begin with? P. Okay. So we want to have some familiarity with the hybridizations. I will keep coming back to it. It does help us predict something about the reactivity of each of the molecules that we look at throughout the semester. Okay. So please be aware of those. Um, those should be hopefully quick, easy questions. You can identify it um, rapidly. Where things get kind of tricky, if you go back and look at that quiz, how many lone pairs did I specify on any of the atoms? Daniel, right? Yes. None. None. Okay. That is because chemists are lazy and we like to simplify okay, or uh, imply those electron pairs. So you have to be familiar with that notation. Not so much because of me, but because in your ACS final, that is written by a bunch of old chemists who are inherently lazy. And what are they going to do with the lone pairs? Imply them. Okay? So you will need to be aware of that. The other big tricky point. Okay, let's see if I can actually draw the part of the structure where we had it. Erase. Okay? Take a look at the bottom most arrow, I pointed to that. What atom is that? Carbon. carbon. How do you know it's a carbon? It's not this state, it's usually carbon. Okay. Every single point, doesn't matter where it is, every single point is a carbon. Unless what? Unless we show it otherwise. Okay. So if you go further around that, one of those other points was a nitrogen. So we now know we have a carbon. How many electrons are supposed to be around the carbon? Eight, we're supposed to satisfy the octet, so we could go around and count our electrons. How many electrons are shown around that carbon? Six. 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 Okay. 
Do we see any charges associated with that carbon? No. no. So what does that mean the charge is on that carbon? Neutral. neutral. If it has only six electrons, it's not neutral. So what does that mean? One John, lone pairs. Not lone pairs. Lone pairs are only allowed to be assumed on heteroatoms, nitrogen, oxygen, and halogens. We cannot assume it on carbons. And that's because we assume something else. We assume there's a hydrogen. Okay. So now when we go through and look at this, once we've added that hydrogen on there, how many groups of electrons are there around this? Four, so our hybridization comes out as sp3. Okay. Implied hydrogens are another bane of chemistry students. Okay. Particularly when you're looking at elimination reactions, and sometimes even addition, and trying to identify those pieces and where they're coming from. So you need to be aware of those simplifications and constantly keep them in the back of your head. I do have a slide that summarizes all that. I'll try and make sure I get that posted, or at least throw it up in the next uh, slideshow on Monday so that you've got it to reference. Okay, so that if you have forgotten some of these rules or these simplifications, you need to always have that in front of you when you're attempting problems. Okay, so you can look for these patterns. Three will cover six. Uh, I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on six. As part of your ACS final, you're going to have to be able to uh, determine the relationships between individual structures. I've got a flowchart thing that I can post as well, so you can get access to that and kind of review that material. So it will show up on your ACS final, unfortunately, but the final is supposed to summarize all of organic chemistry, including the stuff from first semester. Okay. Um, seven was a bit tricky, though, unintentionally. If you take a look at the second structure and the third structure. So we're looking at an SN1 reaction. I lied. We're going to cover that later. Eight, we already talked about. Hopefully the rest of those, you just wrote an answer. Okay. Any questions about anything else on there? Can you talk about uh, five? Five. Well, I will talk about five specifically in these slides. I actually threw that structure back into it. Okay. Any other questions for the moment? Okay. I don't think it was all that bad, so should be okay. See how it goes. Uh, what the heck? Why is it not showing stuff? Um, come back out, come back in, see what happens. So one of the things that you'll learn about me I remember, I think I already told you the story how I failed organic chemistry and then went back through and did really well in it. Um, one of the things that I had to shift focus on was no longer worry about the grades and try and learn the material, okay, and understand why things were happening. So when you look at organic chemistry, you're learning an entire new language, you're learning names, you're learning structures, you're learning how things react, okay, there's a lot of different things going on with that. Of those, which do you think is the most important, learning how things react or how to name them? how they react. I came to that exact same conclusion. So the second time I took it, any nomenclature question, I did not answer. Just skipped it. Okay. Turned out nomenclature made up about 10% of the grade. So when I missed an A by 10 points, there was my A. Okay. So I personally despise nomenclature. I think it's a waste of effort. Um, it's just not that important. That said, the ACS final definitely tests on nomenclature. And it's not just name this compound. It's this, is, this compound reacts in such and such a way. What's the product? Okay. They don't give you any structures. So you have to be able to know the name of that compound, draw it out, and then name the product. Okay. So they're testing you on two different things, which means nomenclature is going to be an issue for your final, which means it is going to be an issue for this class, even though that was something that I intentionally did not study. Okay. So this slide you'll see show up again and again and again because it summarizes all of the major topics within nomenclature. And if you get this slide nailed down, I would bet that you'd be able to, at least on a multiple choice, get any nomenclature question correct because it covers pretty much everything that you could possibly see. So it goes through and we'll add extra little additions into that red box. So we need to be aware of the priority of individual functional groups 
and then also how to name those individual functional groups as well. Okay? So acids are our highest priority. We'll deal with those right at the tail end of the semester within the last five weeks. Esters are going to show up in that same category. You've got aldehydes and ketones. That's going to be a major section of uh, this semester, uh, right through the, the meat of this class. Then we've got the alcohols, which we'll talk about today and for the next, I think, three weeks. Amines will be at the very end of the semester. Alkenes, alkynes, alkanes, and halides. You guys should all be familiar with naming those. Okay? And again, they are put in there in order of their importance. So if you see multiple functional groups show up, you still have to name them, but you also have to make sure that you put them together, put the name together in the correct order. Okay? How do we know what the correct order is? This is the primary reason why I hate nomenclature. Some old guy said that's the correct order. Order. Okay? It's one of the reasons why I dislike nomenclature. There's no, exp there's no reason behind anything other than someone said so. Okay? You have to know those rules. Uh, the nomenclature that I'll throw at you, I will try to make to the same level of difficulty as the ACS exam and then probably throw in a couple extras that are strict nomenclature type questions. Okay? Um, but you will find, if you press me about more complex structures, that my nomenclature ability is pretty awful. Okay. Um, I will try my best to help you with that as best as I can, but a lot of the things are just, I've never really picked up. Okay. The rules that I do have memorized are the ones that are up here. And like I said, this will cover like 80% of any structure that you get. Okay. So kind of be aware of those rules. Uh, this hits question number one. So this is my favorite picture, and not just because I spent several days trying to draw it out in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, one of the most common things that I think students get lost in is what's happening in chemistry. We're looking at an interaction between any two atoms. The level of that interaction is going to determine certain chemistries that we're going to evaluate. Okay? So if we take two atoms and we bring them near each other, Right? And they weak very, or they weak, they interact very, very weakly. Right? So we don't form a bond. There's still a type of interaction there. That interaction is now classified as a force. Right? But we could then say, well, what type of force are we seeing there? Is it a London dispersion force, meaning it's ridiculously weak? Or is it a dipole-dipole force? Okay? Now we have some partial charges floating around in there. They're starting to interact with each other. That's got to be stronger than a London dispersion force because we have permanent dipoles. We have permanent positives and negatives. Okay? You can go up to hydrogen bonding. The only reason hydrogen bonding is different is because it's such a prevalent force uh, on our planet. Why is it such a prevalent force? Where is hydrogen bonding? What's the most common hydrogen bonding solvent you can think of? Water. water. Why are we concerned about water? makes up roughly 70, 80% of the planet, okay? So it's a pretty huge uh, compound to work with. That's why we have separate, there's even a whole separate uh, classes about water because of all the complex different interactions that go on with it, okay? If we make uh, our partial charges even stronger and start to make them more and more strictly positive and negative, that's where we shift into ionic forces. Ionic is in this we weird gray area because we can get ionic forces acting as a force, but then it can also translate into an actual bond, and we get ionic bonding. If we then start to have electrons sharing, that's how we've shifted into the bonding, and that's why ionic is weird. As we now start to increase our sharing of electrons, we start to shift into polar covalent versus covalent bonding. Okay? So we're looking at a spectrum moving all the way from the absolute weakest interaction being London dispersion forces, all the way around to the absolute strongest interaction being a full-on covalent bond. Okay? So how do those forces and bonds interact with each other, or how do they correlate? Okay? It turns out that we do see relationships. If we have London dispersion forces, we have a covalent bond. Okay? If we had a dipole-dipole force, that dipole-dipole force had to come from a polar covalent bond. If we have hydrogen bonding as a force, 
that had to come from a polar covalent bond. Okay? So that's why you get the color matching across it. That's the relationship between these. Okay? How does that work out for us? Well, a lot of the intermolecular forces is what you end up studying in the lab, particularly in first semester. Okay? So it's a huge slide for first semester stuff. If we look at phase transitions, melting points, boiling points, those are all determined based on what? A bond or a force, at least in organic chemistry. It's melt water. Okay, let's take a molecule, a solution of water here. So a solution is going to have a whole bunch of water molecules floating around in it, right? So let's draw another one here. When we go through a phase transition, what happens? So I want to step away from what's actually breaking here. Let's go back to bonds versus forces. Are we breaking a physical bond or are we breaking the force? It's a force. So when we go through a phase transition, it's all about the intermolecular forces. And this is where we come in and say hydrogen bonding. <coughs> Why is hydrogen bonding bad, or why is it a bad name? Because we think it's a bond. It's not a bond, it's a force. Okay? So that when we go through to melt a species, we are not breaking bonds. What we are breaking is the intermolecular forces holding those molecules together. So if we want to predict what kind of a compound would have the highest melting point, we want to know that compound's intermolecular forces. So which intermolecular force is the strongest? Ionic. Where are we going to see ionic forces? Where are those going to come from? What kind of compound can generate ionic forces? Go back to the diagram. Keep it simple. We have to have an ionic bond in the structure. Right? So if we can look at an individual structure for our draw, or look at a drawing that we've made, we can now correlate our bonds and say, okay, what's going to happen in a bulk phase? Now I know what forces are going to show up. So if you go back to question one, what we'd want to go through and do is classify all of the bond types that we see within those questions or within those structures. Right? And we've only got three bond types. So what are the three bond types present, or what bond types are present in that first question? How would we identify if we had an ionic bond? What would we expect to see? We'll go back to your definition, Josh. You started to go with. Metal and a non-metal is a common way to see it. Do we have any metals in those stru structures? No. What's another way that you could potentially see ionic bonds? Yeah, you could actually see a positive or negative charge written on that structure. Do we see positives or negatives? Nope. So ionic bonding is out of the picture. What other things do we have in there? We have covalent bonds. Are covalent bonds uh, what defines a covalent bond? Sharing of electrons. Okay. Every bond shares electrons, though. So let's narrow our definition a little bit. Okay, every bond is going to have overlapping orbitals to a certain extent. Okay, if you think all the way back in theory, your textbook presented that a bond was actually a sharing of electrons where the atoms involved in it had very similar electronegativities. Okay, so in, di in theory, it says that the electronegativity difference between those two atoms is something like less than 0.5. Okay, cool. How many of you know the electronegativity for carbon? How about nitrogen? Oxygen? Any one of the halogens? Hydrogen? Anything on the periodic table? Anybody know the electronegativity for? Anybody? Nobody? Usually I get one person. Okay. There's a reason why. It's a bit excessive to go through and memorize those. So we want to come up with another pattern for this. Covalent bonds? Anything bound to itself? Anything to, I guess we'll call that just self. The other common one, carbon bound to hydrogen. hydrogen is our other classification for covalent. So we can go through our structure and we can see we do have tons of covalent bonds. 
Okay? Notice when we classify covalent, we aren't saying anything about double or triple bonds, and that's because it's going back to the atoms involved in the bond. If it's a carbon that's doubly bonded to a carbon, that's a carbon bounded to the same atom. Okay? So we would classify that as a covalent bond. What happens in the ionic bond? We already came up with another definition for that. We said metal and non-metal. Sorry, that's a terrible abbreviation, but it's close enough. We could also say positives and negatives. What does that leave for polar covalent? Everything else. Okay. Which could be a lot of the periodic table, except this is organic chemistry, and we don't have to stress that much about it. Typically what we're looking at is anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen. Do we have oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen in our structure? Yes. What does that mean? We have a polar covalent bond. If we have polar covalent bonds, what are the primary forces that we're going to be concerned about? Hydrogen bonding, anything else? Dipole, dipole. Do those have equal force? Nope, hydrogen bonding is a stronger force. So now what we'd have to go through and do is determine when do we have hydrogen bonding? You all know that definition, right? When do you have hydrogen bonding? Nitrogen. When you have a hydrogen, hence hydrogen bonding, physically bound to nitrogen, nitrogen oxygen, or fluorine, only those three elements. So now you go back to the structure. Do we have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? Yes. yes. Which one has that? The one, okay, sorry, that was, I guess was a dumb question. The one that has the nitrogen, okay? So that structure has hydrogen bonding, okay, available to it. What does the other structure have? Can it hydrogen bond with itself? Let's be careful on that one, I guess. Do we have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine in that other structure? No. So can it hydrogen bond? No. Which one has the stronger force? <coughs> the one with the nitrogen. Okay. We would predict that one to have the higher melting point. Okay. Kind of makes sense? So we go back to kind of the basics of what we understand with each of these bonds and forces. How we got those basics was looking at differences in electronegativity. Okay? So a lot of it just kind of doubles back and repeats itself again and again and again. And if it sounds like I'm a broken record by the end of the semester, I did my job right. Okay? Uh, I guess before I wanted to do that. The next thing we could also do is push those into reactivity. All the reactions that we're going to be doing this semester, I'm going to constantly be act asking, what do you see as the source of reactivity? And what I'm asking for is, do you see something that's positive? Do you see something that's negative? If you do, that's a potential site of reactivity. And that's where we get our extra definitions. Okay? And that's what these things are. Our Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, our Lewis acids and bases, and our electrophiles and nucleophiles. Okay? So it's a question of applying these definitions to all the chemistry that we see. Okay? So what is the definition of a Bronsted acid? I think I heard that, but I'm going to simplify it. We're looking at a proton donor. If we were looking at a structure, what's going to be the first thing we hope to see? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Good first answer. I like that. Okay. What charge should that hydrogen be? It should be, it won't be formally positive because then it won't be attached to the structure, but we should see a wicked huge positive, partial positive charge. Why would it be partially positive? Because whatever it's attached to is very electronegative. Go back and look at your common acids. What's the characteristic? They all have hydrogen, and the atom that that hydrogen is attached to is electronegative. Okay? If we go over to Bronsted bases, what's the characteristic for Bronsted bases? Proton so we could go back to our definition of a proton acceptor. But if I'm going to look at a structure and trying to determine what sites or what types of chemistry available to it, I'm not going to see the proton yet because all I'm doing is looking at it before it reacts. So we need something else. 
it's going to need to have some source of electrons. So we could either look for a partial negative or a formal negative. Okay. One way to see partial negatives is to look for lone pairs. Okay, so what we're trying to do is identify these potential reactions. What happens when we move to a Lewis acid? Because Lewis went all crazy on us. He said these definitions aren't good enough. What did he say? He said protons only applies when we're transferring a hydrogen. Not all chemistry transfers hydrogens. What does all chemistry transfer? Electrons. electrons. So Lewis changed his definition and said, okay, I want to look at electrons, not protons. Okay, but his definition must still match or mesh with Bronsted's because we know Bronsted's <coughs> does work as well. Okay? So if Lewis, if a Lewis acid has to deal with electrons, what is it going to do with those electrons? It has to accept them. Look back to your Bronsted acid. You're donating H plus. If we look at the flip, what did it do? That H plus had to accept electrons. So we're looking at an electron acceptor. When we go back to our definitions and we're trying to identify something in our structure that can act as an electron acceptor, hydrogen is a weird one. That's why it typically gets shuttled off into the Bronsted definition. So for a Lewis acid, we won't look at it as hydrogen. What should we look for within the structure to signify that it can accept electrons? We're looking for something that lacks electrons, either a partial positive or a formal positive charge. What's going to give a partial positive charge? Polar covalent bonds. Whatever our atom is must be bonded to something highly electronegative. Okay. Lewis base. What's the Lewis base going to be? Now we're looking at an electron donor. What do we expect to see from our electron donor? We would expect to see some of our lone pairs, which is where I'm going to stick with for our partial negative now, or a formal negative charge. Okay. These are big tip-offs. That doesn't mean anything that is negative will act as a Lewis base. Okay? There's other things that mitigate these definitions. What's an electrophile or a nucleophile? Okay. Also known as an electron acceptor. So an electrophile is a Lewis acid. A nucleophile is a Lewis base. Okay, they match up exactly the same. Okay. One of the things that I will ask throughout the semester is to identify the electrophile and the nucleophile, or the most electrophilic and the most uh, nucleophilic. Because if you can identify those, that gets you at very least one step in the reaction. After that one step, you get to try again, find another most positive, most negative. Gets you another step. Okay. which can be a bit rough if you've got 12 steps to get through, but at least you have a guaranteed way to move forward. Okay. And it doesn't always mean it's right, but it gets you somewhere. Okay. It gets you thinking about what's happening. Make sense? So we could go back and look at our acid-base characteristics. Okay. I do tend to try and group things, particularly because when I, most of this material is coming from fundamental organic. Halogens, we'll pretty much only see those act as acids or leaving groups. Okay? And so now when we look at acid bases, when I ask for what's the acid, we're primarily looking at the Bronsted definition. Okay? If I was going to ask for Lewis definitions, I'd add the Lewis in there. So our halogens, if we see a halogen in our structure, it's very likely that it could act as an acid if... quite want to go with that. Are our halogens going to be partially positive anytime soon? So what acid am I referring to? Bronsted acid. So if we see a halogen in our structure, it could very well act as an acid if it's willing to give up its proton. If it's connected to a hydrogen. Okay? So we'd be looking at an inorganic acid. The structure would be HCl. 
HBR, HI, HF, okay, all of those are potentials for acids. If they aren't connected to a hydrogen, then they can't act as Bronsted-Lowry acids. Why not? It's the definition of a Bronsted-Lowry acid. It has to donate a hydrogen. If there's no hydrogen, it can't act as an acid. So the other option is that it can act as a leaving group, meaning it will take the electrons away from whatever atom it's attached to, very, very similarly uh, to what it would have done in the case of a Bronsted acid. All right. We could then move across our periodic table. Well, I guess that's to the left. Oxygen is in kind of a gr uh, gray area. It acts as both an acid and a base in most conditions. And we're going to evaluate a lot of that chemistry with the first chapter. Nitrogen will primarily act as a base. We can make it act as an acid, but that's not the easiest thing to do. Okay? And then carbon is typically neutral as far as acid-base characteristics go. Okay? And again, we can force a lot of these things to do different chemistry. I can force nitrogen to act as an acid. It's not easy, but I can do it. I can force a carbon compound to act as an acid. There has to be other extenuating circumstances present. Okay? And that's a lot of what second semester is. Here's an extra circumstance that goes against what we would typically see. Okay? So these are our general patterns. We want to apply these later on. Okay? If we want to try and determine acid-base strength, okay? so can we alter our acid-base strengths? So is it just that a hydrogen is bound to an atom and that's the end of it? Okay, no, it does apply to other things. So if we went through and looked at the question on the quiz, question five, I asked typically the harder question, which is looking for base strength. We'd want to go and try and determine what makes a base a good base. All of our definitions, our base needed to do what? What was our definitions of bases? Accept a proton, but to accept a proton, what did it need to do? Donate electrons. So our common characteristic for bases is it's got to have a lot of electrons. The more electrons it's got, the more likely it could donate those. Okay? And so there's different things that apply to those. We're typically looking at atoms that are more negative because that's going to allow them to give up those electrons. They have excess electrons. So one of the first things we'll look for is do we have available electrons? If there's no electrons on that atom, for instance, most carbons, can it act as a base? No, there's no electrons for it to share. Okay? We can then go through and look at size. Typically, we want smaller being a stronger base. Why is that important? Opposite of that. The smaller it is, we're condensing those electrons into a smaller area. The more likely they'll reach out and grab something else. Okay? Um, and yes, there are odd relationships within that. We can also look at electronegativity. The lower the electronegativity, typically the stronger. Why would that make sense? Uh, electronegativity is going to keep its It's going to hold the electrons. It's going to prevent that bond from forming. Okay? We can also go all the way into resonance. Look at more negative uh, being stronger, so if we can push resonance arrows through our structure and put a negative charge on that atom, that's usually going to be a big symbol that we're looking at a stronger base. If we go through and try and do resonance and our atom becomes less negatively charged, what does that mean? It's going to become less basic because we don't have those electrons present. So when we go back to the question, it asked why nitrogen 2 is more basic than nitrogen 3. Right? So I could have asked an easier question, why is nitrogen 2 more basic than oxygen 4? How about the availability of electrons? So this one's a little bit weird. Availability of electrons, which one has more electrons? Oxygen or nitrogen? Oxygen. Oxygen. But the nitrogen's more basic. What's happening there? How many electrons can any atom donate at any given instant? Two. So even though oxygen has more lone pairs, only two or one of those lone pairs is available to react. 
So when we go through and compare nitrogen versus the oxygen, we won't look at the number of lone pairs. As long as we've got one, we now move on. Okay? Size. Is there a difference in size between nitrogen and oxygen? There's two fun answers with this one. You'd be right either way. I'll go with yes. Okay? If we go with yes, technically there is a size difference. Let's push it a little bit further. How much of a size difference is there? Very, very small. It's relatively small. With an individual row, you can assume the size is identical. Okay? So there is no difference in size, which means we don't have a stability argument there. Electronegativity. Is there a difference in electronegativity? Yeah, oxygen is more electronegative. What does that mean about its willingness to share its electrons? Less willing. Less willing. Which one's the stronger base? More willing. The nitrogen. Okay. If we push between two and three, okay, same number of available electrons, same size, same electronegativity. Now it's a resonance. Can we do resonance with this structure? Okay. And this, everybody hates, and I'm sure I get yelled at by different instructors for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Okay? If you have electrons, you should try and do resonance, period. I don't care what you were learning. Try it. So let's go ahead and pick nitrogen number two. How many of you think there's resonance with nitrogen number two, with the lone pairs that it has? Yes? No? How many of you don't think there's resonance? I gave a yes and a no answer, right? <laughs> Didn't I give both? Okay, so to do resonance, what we want to do is find our electrons. Okay, so we're going to take that lone pair and we're going to move it into a bond. We could try and move it towards the hydrogen. How many bonds would we have between the nitrogen and the hydrogen? Two. Okay, hydrogen can only have one bond, which means we have to break a bond. So what happens? We may have formed those two bonds, but now the electrons go right back. Ta-da! That's not very exciting. No resonance that direction. Our electrons went out and right back. Okay, so let's try the other direction. So typically we'll ignore pushing arrows towards hydrogen because hydrogen's not very good at accepting electrons. Let's go try the other way. How many bonds would we now have between the nitrogen and that carbon? Okay, three. Nitrogen can have three bonds. That's not too bad. What other bonds does carbon have, though? It has two more bonds. So carbon now has how many bonds? Five. Five, which is too many for it. So we have to break a bond. What bonds are we allowed to break when we deal with resonance? Double and triple. Only pi bonds. So that does classify as double and triple, but I prefer pi bonds. Okay. Where do we have a pi bond? Oh, to the, first the one we just made. So what happens? Goes right back. Goes right back. Do we have any extra structures showing resonance around that nitrogen or that lone pair of electrons? No. So we'd then go through and do the same reasoning on nitrogen 3. Take those electrons, move them over. How many bonds do we now have in there? Two. Two. How many bonds would that carbon now have attached to it? Four. Well, if you break the hydrogen then. So carbon started with four. If we add an extra bond in there, how many bonds would that carbon have? Five. Can a carbon have five bonds? No. What do we have to break? Pi bond. Do we have multiple pi bonds? Yes. Which pi bond do we want to break? It's resonance. It doesn't matter. We can either break the one that we just made, in which case that kind of defeated the purpose of us moving it there anyway, or we could try and break the other one. Okay. Now carbon's happy. Didn't lose, or it still has its eight electrons. It's got its octet. We haven't exceeded anything. So we go now out to that oxygen. Oxygen has picked up an extra lone pair of electrons. In the process of doing that, has it exceeded its octet? No. So what does that mean? It's okay. That's resonance. Valid resonance structure. So how does that impact us? Nitrogen 3, we have someplace else to move the electrons which means those electrons are going to be more or less likely to react with a hydrogen. Less likely because we've given them an option to go somewhere else. In the case of nitrogen 2, there is no other place for that lone pair to go. It can only react with a hydrogen. Whereas in nitrogen 3, 
We've given those electrons another alternative that's going to reduce its reactivity with hydrogen. Effectively, what we've gone through and done is evaluated the partial negative charge on nitrogen 2 and nitrogen 3. Nitrogen 2 is more partially negative than nitrogen 3. Okay? And yes, drawing that out completely, we do generate some partial charges and all sorts of other fun stuff. You should be able to go through with this structure and rank all of those. One, two, three, four, according to their acid or their base characteristics. Okay? So I'll leave you guys to do that if you want to figure that out. Okay? When are we done? 1.55. Oh, I was like, I've got over an hour? <laughs> wow, time is going in reverse. Um, so there are four primary uh, reaction types that you're going to deal with this semester or you dealt with last semester. This semester, all we're going to do is go back over these same four types, and we're going to add in some extra names to them. Um, you'll see other names like EAS, electrophilic aromatic substitution. You'll see nucleophilic addition reactions. You'll see all sorts of other weird names show up, aldol condensations. All they are is a mixture of these four common types. Okay? So when we looked at these, in, or when you looked at these in first semester, you looked at just one reaction, usually one, maybe two steps. Uh, I think to the largest, you probably went three steps as far as an indi individual reaction went or mechanism. The rest of the reactions we see this semester start to propagate out longer. Towards the end, you're pushing 12 to 15 mechanistic steps. Okay? That's just one reaction. Okay? If we then push to really what we're, our ultimate goal is, is you get a structure and then you need to come up with some way to make that compound. That might involve 15 reactions. Each of those reactions has a 15-step mechanism to explain it. Okay? No, I won't ever test you something like that. Okay? So what we're going to push for is try and get three to four-step reactions going because the ACS test, I don't believe, tests more than that. So you need to be able to string together a series of reagents to generate different products. Right, to prove that you understand what those reagents do, that's where the mechanisms will come into play. Okay? So if we take a look at these, uh, we've got a couple different options that we can go through as far as approaching these. We could go through and just label them now as acid-base substitution elimination or addition. Uh, these aren't the exact ones that showed up on the quiz, but they're pretty close to that. Before we even get into those names, what we could evaluate is what bonds were broken and what bonds were formed. Okay? And this is something I like to ask a lot. Because if you can identify the changes that occurred across the reaction, you can start to classify what occurred and start to come up with those pieces. Were those pieces already provided? Or do you need to add them as a reagent okay, to force that chemistry to occur? So let's take a look at that first one. What's the difference? What bond was broken? Hydrogen bond where? to the oxygen. So we could mark that. Were there any bonds formed? Hydrogen to the nitrogen. So now we'd go across this reaction, evaluate what changed. Okay, all we did was took a hydrogen from one atom and we put it on a different atom. What type of reaction cl is classified by the transfer of a hydrogen atom, or rather a hydrogen ion? An acid-base reaction. So identifying, and th yes, this is admittedly a simple example, but identifying what changed can allow you to come up with these ideas okay, and figure out what occurred. Take a look at the next one. What bond was broken? Heard it? We've got that carbon iodine bond was broken. Were there any bonds formed? Carbon Cl. No transfer of hydrogen, so we're probably not looking at an acid-base reaction. And we want to look at what else changed. Well, we took a chlorine atom, and we put that in in place of an iodine, also known as substitution. substitution. Right. What happened in the next reaction? What bonds were broken? We've got a carbon iodine bond broken. Agreed. 
the tricky one, there's also a carbon-hydrogen bond broken in this case. Okay? How can you tell that that bond was broken? That's, this reaction, in my opinion, is one of the more difficult ones because of that hydrogen. Is that, there's like a double bond there? Kind of. We could go back to the double bond. Whoa. We go saw away. Full carbon iodine bond broke and the electrons went to the iodine. So, so that explains that one, but how do we know a hydrogen was broken in the process? This case is a little bit nice because you see H. We didn't start with H. Now H is there. That hydrogen had to come from somewhere. Okay? Given that I only gave you one thing to start with, the hydrogen had to come from the structure. Somewhere or another, we had to find that hydrogen. So now, which hydrogen was broken? We could go back and compare. Okay, remember uh, on Monday, we said go through and count things very carefully. If we counted, see this shows up, that carbon is carbon number one. Where's carbon number one in our product? I know, that's terrible numbering. Sorry. Let me try that as carbon number two. Where's carbon number two in our product? Okay, it's one of the carbons with the double bond. Because it's not a symmetric product, you should be able to identify that that was our, our carbon. If we go through and now look at the hydrogens attached to carbons one, two, three, and four, and five, in both the reactant and the product, what you should notice is the change happening around carbon number three. It has two hydrogens in the reactant. If we go to the product, how many hydrogens are there? It's only one. There are four bonds around that carbon right now. We cannot have another hydrogen there, which means it had to have been removed, which means we go back to our reactant. That's our hydrogen that needs to get removed. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Okay? What type of reaction is that? Okay, it's an elimination. We have eliminated a small molecule from that structure. Okay, in this case, that small molecule was HI. I drew them intentionally separated because it makes more physical sense that they were separated. Why does it make more sense that HI is separated? Can you tell me about HI? Take it a step further, what were you strong. saying? It's a strong acid. Strong acids, by definition, dissociate into their ions. Okay, so it doesn't really make sense to put it together. Okay? Very last one, we could do process of elimination on this, but very last one is what type of a reaction? Addition. We started with two things and we ended with one thing. We've now added these two structures to each other. Okay? So to me, the eliminations and the additions tend to get a little bit tricky because in both those cases you typically see a lot of transfers of hydrogen ions uh, and in one case you'll see it and in the other case you won't because we'll start to imply it. Okay, so in the elimination we implied it in the starting material. In the addition reactions it's typically implied in the product. Okay, I know this notation looks a little bit weird for that addition reaction but where would the hydrogen show up in that product? Which one, is, where is it? So we can try it as kind of a hot or cold. Is it this atom? Is it that green one? That doesn't show up very well. Let me try red. Is it this atom? Is that where the hydrogen would show up? No. How about this one? Are any of these little dots hydrogen atom? No. How about this one? Why not? What charges hydrogen typically? Positive. Okay. Our delta positive is most likely where our hydrogen shows up. It's not always the case, and we will see reductions or reduction reactions where we're adding multiple hydrogen atoms. Uh, and those hydrogen, or instead of adding a hydrogen ion, we'll be adding a hydride or H minus. Okay. Very rare to occur, but it does happen. There are very particular reagents that allow that. In fact, the experiment you guys are doing next week involves using hydride as a reagent. Okay? Questions about that? Hi. Okay.
rules for resonance and mechanisms. We already talked about resonance. These are kind of the steps that I would go, oh man, I put my definitions here. Um, these are the steps that I would go through and process through resonance. So we found a source of electrons, we picked that lone pair, and we moved them. Okay? The only way we can move electrons is from an atom to a bond or a bond to an atom. There is a third way that I didn't show up there. What is that third way? Say our electrons start in a bond. We could move them to the atom. Once they're in the atom, where could they move? To another bond. So the third way is really shortcutting those two steps. It's moving from bond to bond. Okay? Kind of just shortens the amount of arrows that you would have to draw. Uh, and then what we would do is once we've moved those electrons, verify that our octet is satisfied. If it's not satisfied, we need to account for that either with charges or by breaking pi bonds. If we've exceeded the octet, we must break pi bonds. Why do we not break sigma bonds? Because it's not resonance. Okay? Sigma bonds, you're breaking the structure. When we're looking at resonance, we cannot touch sigma bonds. They are too strong. The pi bonds are weaker because... Anybody? Because of the way the structure is, when you've got the overlapping a sigma bond say if we looked at some sp orbitals are overlapping like that and we get this overlap in between and it's probably going to be more than that but we get that direct overlap if we look at a pi bond where are the electrons in a pi bond where's the overlap isn't one Okay. We get an indirect overlap when we're looking at pi bonds. Okay. And the electrons, wow, it really doesn't show up over there. I Trust me, it'll show up if you look it up on YouTube. We do see the electrons kind of share uh, quantum tunneling across the top of that. Okay. Even if we brought these atoms even closer, such that those two p orbitals could overlap, what happens in the process of the sigma bond overlap? becomes even stronger. So at no point do we ever see the pi bonds get that direct overlap or get as much of a direct overlap. Okay? So we can look at it as an overlap argument. We could also look at it back as the hand when I'm running into Sean, right? Good. Running into Sean. Which part do we care about? Okay? He's going to care about my hand running into him. Which orbitals are furthest away from the nucleus or most likely to interact first? P orbitals, the sp, are buried inside the structure. Okay, our sigma bonds tend to be buried. Our p orbitals are much more available to react. They're much higher in energy, much more likely to, to push on. Okay. If we go through and look at mechanisms, we'll do things very, very similarly, except what we're going to end up doing is starting to break bonds. Okay, and we've got a couple options when we go through and break bonds. We can break pi or sigma now, and that's because when we do a mechanism, we are breaking bonds. We are changing the structure. Okay, so it is fine. It is okay to break sigma bonds. But what we want to do is pick the easiest bond to break first. Always pick the pi, and then if later you need to, you can come back and break the sigma bond. Again, why do we break the pi over the sigma? easier to break. Okay? The pi bond is a weaker bond than it is the sigma. Okay? Uh, another quick note about showing mechanisms with curved arrows. Always, 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 please move your electrons from uh, a negative to a positive, from a source of electrons to some place that is missing electrons. Okay? And never, ever, ever move atoms with your arrows. Okay, which is probably one of the more difficult concepts to get through because when we go through and do a reaction, when we draw something out, we draw out a structure, how many electrons do you draw? Do you actually draw on the electrons? If I asked you to draw NH3, what was the acceptable answer that you guys were all cool with before I was like, really? Really? If we draw out NH3, what's an electron look like? What's our symbol for an electron? A dot. Anybody see a dot in that structure? Do we show electrons when we draw out our structures? 
They are implied, they are built into the structure, but nine times out of 10, we imply our electrons in one form or another. We imply them either in lines, saying they're bonds, or we imply them as a lone pair on our heteroatoms. Okay? It's an evil thing to do, but that's what we do. When we go through and do a mechanism, we look at these structures and we say, oh, the structure's changed. What do we see has changed? The location of an atom. Remember, though, our mechanism only shows the flow of electrons, the things that we aren't showing. Okay? So it is kind of an odd thing to get used to. Please, please, please watch out for that. Okay? Wow, I want to figure out what's going on with that screen because our color in here is pretty bad. Um, so in theory... Uh, you should be familiar with some of these functions. Well, that light, that was a bit excessive. Okay, we don't have a choice. Um, alkanes, alkyl halides and alkenes, technically you've got the alkynes. I typically don't throw those in there because their chemistry is very similar to the alkenes. I said 55, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I've gone through and done, how did that light come on? What I've gone through and done for each of these is summarize the intermolecular forces, uh, and then went through and did something with boiling points and melting points for that matter. Whoa, that's even worse. Okay. Um, so to identify these forces, how are we going to identify the forces available? What do we have to do? Look to the bonds. What types of bonds are present in each of these structures? And then we go through and start to classify those forces. Okay. That gives us some idea of the physical properties of each of these species. We can then push this even further and start to look at their reactivity. When we look at the alkanes, do we have any partial charges? Not really. Okay, why do we not say hydrogen is positive on a carbon? I mean, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. What type of bond did we say it was? isn't big enough. We don't generate enough of a dipole moment to have that hydrogen act as a positive or have the carbon act as a negative. Okay? So what does that mean? Our reactivity is virtually nothing. So how do we get those to react? That's where we run into radical reactions, okay, which I believe was covered at the very tail end of your last semester. Okay? Um, they will show up every so often um, I will try and review them when they actually do pop up. I'm not a big fan of radical reactions because they just do anything you would ever want them to do, they can do. So it's frustrating. Um, when we move to the alkyl halides, as far as their reactivity, okay, we'll go around where our charges are. Why do we not look at the CH3 out here as being reactive? Carbons and hydrogens, no charges. No difference in electronegativity. So where does our chemistry sit? Comes right in at that carbon and chlorine bond. That's an eraser. Because chlorine is more electronegative than that carbon. What charge does that chlorine build? Partial negative. What charge does the carbon build? Partial positive. We can now go through and match our definitions. Okay? If we go through and look at our definitions, we could try and pair these up and say which one of these can match up. Chlorine, while it may be partially negative, how many bonds can it have? How many bonds can chlorine in organic chemistry have? One. How many bonds does it currently have? One. Is it going to do any real chemistry? Probably not. What happens with the carbon? Partially positive. Okay. I could bring in another thing to it, but then the carbon would be, have five bonds. But do I have a weak bond that I could potentially break? Yeah, chlorine wants to leave, wants to take the electrons already. So that means my carbon can now act as an electrophile. So what we do is look at that structure, start to evaluate and match up the definitions to what possibilities we get. So when you go through or when you went through and looked at the reactivity of alkyl halides, you saw substitution and elimination reactions. And all of those revolved around that partially positive carbon and coming up with ways to stabilize it. If we did a substitution reaction, how did we stabilize it? S, what's the symbol? What are our mechanisms for substitution? Two types of mechanisms. SN1 and SN2. What's the N stand for? Nuclear. 
nucleophilic or a nucleophile, what do we bring in to stabilize that positive carbon in a substitution reaction? A nucleophile, okay? So we could bring in our source of electrons as a nucleophile. If we looked at an elimination reaction, where did we get our electrons from? A neighboring carbon-hydrogen bond. So we took the electrons away from a hydrogen and shuttled those electrons in to stabilize it. Okay? So it's that partial charge, it's that carbon atom being positive that drives all of the functionality of that, or the reactivity of that functional group. What happens when you move to the alkene? Again, we're pushing into stuff that you guys may or may not have seen. Where's the reactivity in the alkene? What atoms are present? Carbon and hydrogen, which would tend to put us into alkane reactivity. So we'd go, oh, this doesn't have any reactivity. Do alkenes have reactivity? Why are they different from alkanes? Uh, I think it was all said kind of at once in there. Not so much the carbon-carbon single bond, but the carbon-carbon double bond, because what orbitals are involved there? P orbitals. Those P orbitals are higher in energy, more available, and can react. So within the alkene, that double bond acts as an electron source. What definition matches an electron source? We have a nucleophilic carbon. We also have a Bronsted-Lowry basic carbon, okay? For a Bronsted-Lowry base to work, it has to be able to share its electrons with a hydrogen. Well, if we got electrons, can we share it with a hydrogen or another atom? Yeah. So we end up with both definitions, okay? And now we're starting to get into new material here a little bit, but I think I was going to do more review, so we'll talk about the alcohols just a little bit here just to tease you into that chapter. What happens when we now look at the alcohol? We want to identify our reactivity again. Is there a partial negative somewhere in there? Yeah, where is it? On the oxygen. How is it becoming partially negative? More electronegative. More electronegative than? Than the carbon that's attached to. Okay, carbon, I agree. So that means the carbon becomes? Partially positive. Partially positive. Is there anything else that it could pull electrons from? <coughs> the hydrogen. What happens to the hydrogen then? Partial positive. Now that we've identified our charges, what can we do? Go back to our definitions and apply each of these partial charges back to the definitions and see what things we come up with. This is why alcohols are awful. Every single one of our definitions matches. Okay? So alcohols can pretty much do all types of chemistry. We get everything showing up with these. You've got them acting as a Bronsted-Lowry acid in particular circumstances because we've got that hydrogen bound to an electronegative element. We can also have them act as a Bronsted-Lowry base because that oxygen has lone pairs. It can share those with a hydrogen. We also have a nucleophilic oxygen. It can share those electrons with some other atom. We also have that electrophilic carbon because it's now lost those electrons, okay? So our alcohols, depending on your perspective, can both be really fun and really obnoxious as far as our chemistries. We've got a lot of stuff to evaluate when we go through and look at their reactivities, okay? That is time. The rest of this is kind of a review. I will probably still go through and do this review before we go through and do...